Hello everybody and thank you very much for joining this webinar today on uh, how to pick a fund, how to pick a fund manager. My name is Ryan Hughes of uh, AJ Bell uh, and I'm delighted to be talking uh, about this today to you. Uh, I anticipate that this webinar will take around 30 minutes um, to, uh, to talk through uh, and you are able to uh, ask questions at, uh, at any point during the presentation uh, on the question box on the right hand side uh, of the control panel. Uh, when we get to the end of the uh, presentation, then we'll endeavour to work through as many of those questions uh, as we possibly can. Uh, any technical problems that you have, then please do report those in the question box uh, and uh, we will be able to get back to you hopefully uh, with an answer on the question box as well on, the, on that right hand side. So uh, if you have a problem, do look out uh, for that. Uh, and uh, after we finish the webinar, about an hour later, uh, we'll actually send you a, an email with a feedback form. Uh, with uh, information on where you can download these slides uh, and, uh, and hopefully you'll be kind enough to give us some feedback uh, on this uh, session. Do please check your junk email folder uh, if you uh, do not get this email or can't find this email uh, as it may well have uh, a slipped through um, into there. Uh, just before I start, just to give you a little bit of background about, about me and perhaps why I'm uh, suited to talk about how to, uh, to, to pick an investment manager, uh, I have around 20 years investment experience and about the last 15 years of those uh, I've been uh, interviewing fund managers uh, and that has meant over the years that I've now interviewed literally hundreds of different managers across all kinds of different strategies. And what I wanted to do today was to share with you some of the insights uh, that I found that, that, that are helpful in thinking about investments, uh, not just about the questions that you should ask, but also about thinking uh, about your own uh, behavioral characteristics and how you should look uh, at, different, uh, at different strategies. So without further ado, let's just uh, jump straight forward. Before we start, of course, it's important that we uh, that we do uh, just flag uh, the risk warnings to you. So uh, forgive me just for a few seconds to uh, to go through this. So the value of your investments can go down as well as up, and you may well get back less than you originally invested. We don't offer advice, so it is important that you understand the risks. And if you're unsure, please consult a suitably qualified financial advisor. The tax treatment depends on your individual circumstances and rules may change. Past performance is not a guide to future performance and some investments need to be held for the long term. So the agenda of things I wanted to go through today, uh, and this will be quite a race through, so do forgive me for, uh, for, for perhaps going, trying to cover quite a bit of ground, but it's a, it's a big topic uh, to squeeze in. We'll look at the different types of investment approach, uh, the separating the skillful from the lucky, uh, what to look for in a fund manager, uh, importantly, but also think about does past performance matter, uh, which is a, an area that gets a lot of attention. Understanding the, uh, the key investor information document, uh, a little bit of maths, unfortunately. Uh, we'll need to go, go through a little bit of mathematics, but we'll try and keep it uh, brief and, uh, and straightforward. Also, we'll point out where to look for different information and finally summarize with, uh, with lessons to remember uh, for, uh, for investors. So hopefully that will, that will cover the, 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 all the types of ground that we, we need to get through today. Now, there is an ongoing debate uh, when in the investment world when trying to think about whether investments is an art or a science. Uh, and, uh, and, and I have a constant uh, discussion with my, my colleagues here uh, about this topic and, and I come up with the, the conclusion that if it's a science, uh, then you'd get the same outcome every time you did the same thing, that have had the same input. Uh, whereas if it's an art, then we need to think about different people's emotions, different people's behaviors. Uh, and I think when we think about investments, the truth is that actually it's somewhere in between. We can use the benefit of science to help us understand different investment strategies, uh, and we can test different investment strategies using scientific approaches. But actually, when it comes down to it, I think the art uh, element is actually about assessing people, about choosing different people to, to manage your investments, uh, about uh, about understanding how they think, understanding how they behave, uh, and ultimately uh, gaining an element of trust uh, that they are the right people to be the custodian of your money. Uh, and, and therefore we can use a balance of both art and science 
when thinking about investment. Uh, and, and the important uh, consideration is how we apply both of those where, when assessing uh, different fund managers. And we'll try and talk through both elements of this uh, as we go through uh, these slides. Just as, a, as a, a brief starting, really, just to think about the different types of uh, investment uh, that there are. There are lots of types of different investment fund uh, available in the marketplace. Here we've seen equity funds, fixed interest funds, funds that invest just in property, uh, and then something called multi-asset uh, that invest in, in all of these different areas. Uh, and then we also see specialist funds, uh, such as absolute return strategies, or perhaps uh, slightly more niche funds that invest just in a particular area such as perhaps just in technology uh, or in healthcare or those types of areas uh, and this presentation has been designed to cover all of these different types of strategies I very much believe that the same lessons hold true across the different asset classes when thinking about different fund management uh, fund managers and the strategies that they use so this is very much uh, been put together uh, regardless of which area of the market you're looking at uh, for a fund uh, and and as a way of thinking about approaching all different types of investments. Now one of the perennial debates that we see uh, in the fund management world is this active versus passive investment um, discussion and it's a constant argument. Many people would say uh, and those that are advocates of passive investment would say that active investment is dead. Now I would disagree with that and I think a great many uh, investment managers would disagree as well, particularly those that are incredibly well known who have great long term track records. Now there is room for both active and passive strategies in the market. Now active management I would certainly contend is populated by a lot of bad managers. There are too many funds that are too expensive and frankly their performance is too poor. But I think it's very important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here uh, and that we, we accept that managers that have an exceptionally good approach, and we'll talk through some of those approaches in a minute, uh, do have the ability to add value versus the market. Uh, but equally it's very important that you choose carefully when looking at these different managers. Now the points that I make in this presentation are focused on when you are assessing active managers, so actively managed funds and not passive strategies. When you're assessing passive strategies, there, there are a different set of criteria to look at and consider uh, when, where, when looking at those and the, the points that I make through this presentation are very much focused on the active side and, and maybe at a later date we'll, we'll do another session that focuses on how to assess a passive strategy, uh, but we'll park that for another day. So if I was to summarize my job in a very, very simple way, uh, where, uh, as someone that's been assessing fund managers for a very long period of time, now I think it's about, a, it's about separating the skillful from the lucky. Um, it's very easy to be lucky over a short period of time. And you see a lot of managers that, that, that exhibit exactly that characteristic. They have a very strong period of performance over a very short period of time. And the skill of someone researching investments and choosing investments is to determine whether that whether that was genuine skill or, or simply just good fortune uh, and I would equate that to simply going to the casino you may you may well visit the casino as a one-off uh, a one-off night uh, and and play the roulette table and walk out making a nice profit now that is very very I would say very very lucky if you go to the casino week after week after week I would I would contend fairly strongly that over time the casino will win uh, and uh, and that, that, there's, that there is not really the evidence of skill uh, in that approach. So over the longer term, skill is separated from luck. It is genuinely difficult to be lucky over a long period. And if we think about long-term investors uh, and well-known investors such as Neil Woodford, Richard Buxton at Old Mutual, Richard Woolnow at M&G, Angus Tullock at First State Stewart. These are managers that have long-term track records that have delivered great returns over very long periods of time. And it would be, I think, right of us to conclude that these managers have exhibited evidence of skill because they've managed to deliver this over a long period of time. They are, haven't just been lucky 
got one or two calls right over a short period of time uh, and, and made some returns from that. Now there are many managers that over a short period of time do simply get one or two calls uh, right and it makes their performance numbers look very, very good. But that is different, I think, from seeing genuine evidence of skill over the long term. We also have to be careful about short-term fads that we see in the, in the investment market. Now, there are lots of things over time, be it the tech bubble uh, of 99-2000 or maybe some would contend the tech bubble of today. Um, healthcare rallies, China rallies, you know, all these types of different areas of investing have all become very popular very quickly uh, and these fads have come and gone uh, and generally when these fads go, uh, it goes very painfully uh, and people are on the wrong side of that and can lose money very, very quickly. So those short-term fads can be very, very dangerous. They can be very profitable, of course, if you time those uh, exactly right uh, and you may get lucky uh, in doing that. But over the long term, what we're trying to discern is those managers that have genuine evidence of skill rather than those that are simply lucky. And fund selection absolutely matters when you're looking at different areas of the market. Uh, and apologies, this is quite a busy site. It's got quite a lot of data on here. But I think it does evidence the, the, the way in which different funds have different performance and, this, and that, that the selection you have when looking at these absolutely matters. So just to talk through this slide, so I've looked at four different areas of the market. I've taken the investment association sectors where they've grouped similar funds together. So we've got the UK or company sector, the North America, sector, the global emerging market sector and the sterling strategic bond sector uh, and what I've done here is simply over the last five years show you the performance of the best fund over that five year period and the performance of the worst fund uh, and there is a vast vast difference between the winners and the losers here so fund selection absolutely matters. What is also important to give some context is also to understand where the index may have been over this period. So in the UK, the FTSE All Share Index over the same five year period is up by about 77%. But of course, the best manager has delivered returns of 197%, so 120% outperformance over the last five years. The worst manager is only up just about 38%. So there we've seen about a 40% underperformance uh, of the market over the same period. And it's a broadly similar picture when we look at the S&P 500 index in, in the North America uh, region in the US uh, and indeed for emerging markets uh, and bonds. There is a vast difference uh, between the winners and the losers and fund selection absolutely matters. Now certainly the advocates of passive investing uh, I think would use this slide to point to the importance of simply investing in a passive strategy uh, because they would say well what's the chances of you choosing the right manager uh, you might as well have a lower feed approach uh, and, and just get some exposure to the market and have a passive solution uh, and there is some argument in that but of course here what we can see is that there are managers who have over a five-year period which is a meaningful period of time managed to significantly outperform the index and add a lot of value uh, and it's important to, I think, to recognize that good managers can outperform. It's also important to recognize that not all, not all managers that are performing poorly are doing a bad job. It may well be that their investment style, and I'll come on to that in a minute, is out of favor. It may well be that their approach is just not the one that the market's looking at right now. They may well not be able to keep up with the market, but when their style comes back into favor, uh, they will have a stronger period of performance. So it's, it's just as important to think about those that are doing very well uh, as it is to look at those that are potentially uh, doing badly, or perhaps more importantly to think about it, doing less well. And what do I see as a key characteristic of managers that are that can are able to do well over time? Well, I'm afraid there is no sub uh, no substitute for hard work. This is all about investment process. This is the characteristic that I see of different managers that are able to deliver uh, consistent, repeatable performance over time. And a repeatable investment process is absolutely key. And I use the word repeatable uh, a couple of times. Uh, really meaningfully here because it is that it is that level of repeatability of those managers that are able to consistently implement the way that they think about investments uh, that is that is critical to their longer term success 
So if we think about this slide, uh, where we've got a couple of different uh, a matrix here, good outcome and bad outcome across the top, good process and bad process uh, down the left-hand side. Well, if you've got a good process and you get a good outcome, we would see that as deserved success. If we've got a good process uh, and, uh, and have a bad outcome, well, that is uh, a bad break. But over time, we would expect that good process to win through. If you have a bad process, well, sometimes you do get lucky, so you can get a good outcome. But it's exactly that. It is just luck. Uh, and if you've got a bad process and a bad outcome, well, I'm afraid you simply get what you deserve. Uh, and when you look at so many different investment managers uh, over time, it is, it is time spent taken to understand their investment process that will help you understand whether they have a good process or a bad process uh, and whether they've got a chance over time uh, of delivering a good outcome or a bad outcome and obviously the longer time we can give these managers particularly those managers that have a good process we would expect that good process to come through into uh, into a good outcome for investors and ultimately that results in deserved success for uh, for investors so it, it is all about process it is about understanding how a manager invests how a manager thinks uh, and how they implement those decisions that will be key to the success of uh, of their investment strategy And it's actually, when we think about uh, a good process, uh, it's very easy to find examples of this, to try and bring this to life a little bit in the world of sport. And because the world of sport has actually shown how important a good process is. So here I've just brought, brought up a couple of different examples from different sports. So Shane Sutton is the architect of the British Olympic cycling success over the last few years. And of course, we've won a huge amount of medals at the Olympics. Uh, and he has thought all about process, about every little marginal incremental gain that he can think about uh, to add 0.1 of a second. And if he finds enough 0.1 of a second, he's got a chance of winning the gold medal. That's the difference between being first and second. He's got a fantastic approach to improve his investment, his process. Now Gary Player famously said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. And again, I think that indicates the point there is no substitute for hard work when it comes to investing. When it comes to you researching your investments, there is no sub substitute for hard work. Uh, and, and he certainly was a great advocate of more and more practice, more and more testing himself. Uh, and funnily enough, he managed to chip in from the edge of the green on a more regular uh, basis than many others because he practiced harder. Clive Woodward, the architect of England's Rugby World Cup success, um, has uh, another one talked about incremental gains and was involved in the Olympics. And Ross Braun, Formula One technician, again, every single tenth of a second, where can he find gains across, uh, across the car and the driver? So all of these four examples are in the world of sport, but I think translate perfectly into thinking about investments and thinking about investment managers so they're able to be able to constantly adapt to a changing world. If you think about the, the environment we've been in just in the last 12 months, we had the Brexit vote, uh, which created huge uncertainty. We had Donald Trump being in, uh, voted in in the US again, creating large uncertainty. Only a couple of weeks ago, having a uh, hung parliament, a minority government in the UK, uh, when people thought there was the potential for a majority government. You know, all of these things throw challenges to investment process that managers have, and they have to adapt and evolve and change the way they think and, 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 and really uh, be, be cognizant of the environment they're working in to, to draw out that investment process and think about constant improvement. If you found any successful manager and talk to them today, uh, if you talk to Neil Woodford today, for example, and talk to him about how he invests today and how he thought about investments 20 years ago, there'll be some common DNA that is there, but he will equally very much talk about how he's, how he's evolved, the way he thinks, how he evolves, the way he approaches companies and different valuations uh, and so on. It's critical to have a constantly evolving and adaptive approach to the world that we live in. So, so what do we look for? What are the key facets that I think about uh, when I'm looking at managers? Well, we're looking for essentially what, what we'd call 
the edge. Uh, and for those of you of a certain age, that's not the U2 guitarist. Uh, it's something about how the manager can beat the market. It's it's where where we think they are different. How are they different? What's the approach that they've got that they, we think enables them to deliver outperformance? And I've listed some characteristics here, which I'll, I'll talk through, uh, and I think are absolutely key for all of you when thinking about investments, looking at different managers uh, and drawing out which ones are most appropriate for your circumstances. So it's absolutely imperative that you understand the investment style that a manager has. Uh, are they a growth manager? Are they a value manager? What, and that really means what type of companies are they looking at? Are they looking at companies that are trying to grow their, their profits and their market share and maybe not hugely profitable at the moment? Or are they looking at a, a value manager who is potentially focusing on companies that are absolutely out of favor uh, and, and have some value in the business that's not recognized by the market? Do they have an income strategy? And there are many other different types of strategy that I could talk through, but the important point is that when you look and assess any fund manager you invest with, you need to understand what their style is. Because if you understand their style, it gives you a frame of reference as to how they will perform or how they should perform uh, in different market conditions. Uh, and that means if they're a growth manager and the market is favoring growth stocks, they should be doing well but potentially they may be doing badly. So you have that frame of reference up front so you can understand when they should be winning and potentially also when they should be underperforming and that's just as important. You should try and understand a manager's investment philosophy and their investment process. So this is about how they think. How do they implement this thinking? This drives absolutely everything that they do. So every manager will be able to talk to you about their investment philosophy and about their investment process. They should have documents, they should have sales agents, they should have brochures that explain to you how they go about their thinking. How do they see the market as inefficient? How do they think they can beat the market? What's their investment process? How do they implement their investment ideas? It's critical again that you understand this before you invest. Experience, manager tenure, how experienced is your manager? Now this I think is not critical that you only look at experienced managers, but it helps. Young managers can be certainly, and inexperienced managers can be very good, but for me investment is about learning from your mistakes. Having done this now for quite a few years, uh, I think I've learned, I've learned more about myself as an investor by thinking about the things I've got wrong rather than thinking about the things that I've got right. You know, those experiences we learn, as human beings, we learn from different experiences, uh, and I think a lot of that learning comes from our mistakes rather than our successes, because that's essentially what keeps you humble. But do look at a manager's experience. Look at their tenure. Look at how long they've been uh, in, in charge of that fund. Look at, look at where they've come from. Uh, look at their, their experience, their asset classes uh, that they've managed. Uh, look at the team. Uh, as the next point there, look at the, is it, a, is it a team approach or an individual approach? Very much thinking about who makes the decisions, what is the key man risk there? And to give you a real life example of this, uh, only two weeks ago uh, on the AJ Bell favourite funds list, we had uh, the Schroeder UK, or company, uh, UK smaller companies uh, fund managed by Paul Marriage. Now, when we looked at that fund, we concluded that, that Paul, as a manager, was integral to the investment process and philosophy, and ultimately was integral to how that fund was likely to perform going forwards. We also concluded that should anything happen to Paul, and he decided to leave managing this fund with his co-manager, then that fund would likely to become an immediate sell for us. And actually, two weeks ago, Paul did announce that he was leaving Schroders uh, to go to a, a new investment house or set up his own investment house. Uh, and that key man risk was too great for us. And so we decided to remove that fund from our favorite funds list uh, and add in a replacement. So the team or individual is very important. And understanding how integral an individual is to the investment approach is crucial to thinking about whether that's going to be a good investment for you or not. Fund size is also important. Is it too small or is it too big? I would say it's never. you should never rule out funds that are small. Uh, often small funds are more flexible, more nimble, uh, and are able to, uh, to adapt to the market far easier. And some of them get their best investment performance while they're small and growing. But equally, you need to look at uh, funds to make sure they're not getting too big. 
funds that get too too big, uh, and and of course, what is the optimum fund size here? Well, that very much depends on different asset classes and different strategies. So. Uh, a fund investing in large UK equities certainly can uh, can uh, run significantly more assets than a fund that's investing in smaller companies. But it's important to understand where that size is. So you can ask a fund manager what their uh, capacity is uh, and how much money do you think they can they can run. And we've seen examples over the years of funds that have got too big. So M&G Recovery, uh, a very uh, well-known UK equity fund grew significantly over a number of years and got to a point where they were holding more and more stocks and the portfolio was getting more and more unwieldy and ultimately they started to to underperform. Cost is also an important consideration but I think value for money is a bigger is a bigger one. It's not just about absolute cost, it's about are they delivering value. So I'm comfortable buying a more expensive fund if they're delivering for me but I'm certainly not prepared to pay over the odds for something that under delivers. So think about value for money. But also, if you are buying an active fund, find managers that are genuinely active. Avoid closet trackers. Avoid managers that simply look like the index uh, and are not investing uh, in, a way, in a way that, that where, where they genuinely say. So you need managers that are comfortable taking risk, uh, are genuinely active. And that doesn't mean changing their portfolio uh, constantly, but, uh, but is prepared to look different to the benchmark. Uh, that is absolutely critical. Now you may have noticed that I haven't really talked about past performance uh, and for very, very good reason. Now, I think too many investors rely on past performance uh, as a way of informing their investment decisions and I wanted to use this example here uh, as, as, a, as a way of illustrating this. So the blue line on this chart is, is a, a well-known investment fund uh, and the red line is the FTSE All Share. So this is, this is performance relative to the market. And this is simply over uh, over a uh, uh, a, 12, uh, a 10 month period from 1999 to 2000, and you can see here that this fund underperformed the market by 22% over that period. Now it'd be very easy to conclude that this manager is a bad manager, uh, has not got an edge, uh, has, has has doesn't have a clear investment philosophy and process, uh, and frankly doesn't know what they're doing. And you'd be better off selling your investment and moving on to a different holding. Well, it's perhaps unsurprising to see, uh, on the basis I'm using this example, that the manager subsequently went on to have a fantastic period of performance. So this was Neil Woodford's track record after that period of poor performance when he managed the Invesco Perpetual High Income Fund. And after underperforming by 22% over a 10-month period, he then went on to outperform by 143% over the subsequent 14 years. Uh, and so relying on past performance, I think, is not necessarily a, a, a great strategy uh, for choosing your investments. Uh, and if we, if we move forward to another example, well, this fund here, the Argonaut uh, Absolute Return Fund, this is over a four-year period, had a fantastic run where they outperformed the market by 83%. And that, that is a truly fantastic run, a stellar return. Uh, and it would perhaps not surprise you to think to think about when did most people buy this fund? Was it right at the beginning of this period when it wasn't necessarily outperforming by very much? Or was it right at the end of this period when the fund had had a huge period of outperformance? And of course you'd be right to conclude that most people piled into this fund right at the top here when it had a fantastic period of performance. Uh, but I think you're already probably ahead of me as to what happened next. Over the subsequent two years, this fund then went on to underperform the index by 50%, just at the point when most people had invested. Uh, and of course, a great is another example of simply relying on past performance to guide you through your investment returns is not a great strategy, uh, because I think it leads you, it has the potential to lead you into areas where you're, 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 you've missed out the great returns and you're about to enter a period where, uh, where that fund has the potential to underperform over the future. This is best summed up by the renowned investor um, Warren Buffett, who, uh, who, and you can see the quote there, in the business world, the rear view mirror is always clearer than the windshield. And this is simply summing it up, the fear of missing out on investment is such a strong human emotion, it's a dangerous emotion. 
uh, and simply then relying on past performance, looking at things that have done well, fear of missing out on those returns, and then joining the party at precisely the wrong moment is a very, very dangerous strategy. Understanding the KID document is important. Uh, this is the key investor information document. You should read all of these for the funds you're looking at. The cru crucial information on here is the objective and policy. Now, this outlines what the fund is trying to achieve and how they go about it. It gives you a very clear idea as to where they're investing and what that investment strategy is. It also helpfully gives you the investment profile, the risk profile on here. So this is uh, laid down by the EU as a score between one and seven. Uh, and uh, with one being a lower risk and seven being the highest risk. And this will tell you, uh, give you a clue as to how risky the different funds are that you're looking at. Uh, and it also has to show you the charges. And these documents are prescribed in how they lay out this information. So they're a very good way of comparing different strategies and how they invest. Now, very briefly, I just promised I'd talk about maths uh, and the key ratios that you should think about. Uh, and there are a number of terms that you may hear uh, or read about when you're looking at different investment strategies. Uh, and I've just got four on here as some of the key ones. There are many, many more that you can read about, but these are, I think, the key ones to look at. So alpha uh, there, alpha is the excess return above a benchmark. And simply, this is, is a manager beating his benchmark? Is he adding alpha? If a manager's outperforming the FTSE all share, uh, then he's adding alpha. And obviously, alpha is a good thing. When you're paying a manager fees, hopefully to outperform the market, you are, you are paying for alpha. If they're delivering that, then you are being rewarded. Now, beta is a little bit different. This is how sensitive your investment is compared to the benchmark. So if you're investment has a beta of one and let's say it's a UK equity fund that moves like the FTSE all share so the FTSE all share goes up one percent we would expect a fund with a beta of one to also go up one percent if it has a beta of more than one we would expect that fund to go up by more than the FTSE all share equally if we have a beta of less than one we would expect that fund to go up less than the FTSE all share but equally if the FTSE all share went down we would expect that fund to go down less than the FTSE all share. So beta is a very important measure to give you an understanding as to how sensitive your investments are to general market movements. Now the sharp ratio uh, is a way of thinking about are you being handsomely rewarded for the amount of risk that you are taking? So if a fund takes lots and lots of risk but you're getting a good return, it's likely to have a good sharp ratio. But maybe the fund is taking a lot of risk and you're not getting a good return, so its sharp ratio will be much less. So it's a very quick way of thinking about uh, are you being uh, adequately rewarded for the risk that your investments are taking. Now volatility, we hear a lot about volatility, a measure of the dispersion of returns is exactly as it sounds, but it's not always the case that high volatility is bad and low volatility is always good. Different strategies have different approaches and some will intentionally be higher volatility. So it's important that you understand the volatility approach of a different fund again before you invest. Where to find different information? Well, it's all about research. There is a lot of free information out there. We have the favorite funds list here at AJ Bell that gives you a condensed version of the funds that we like, and there's a lot of information available on that, that list. Uh, there is a lot of information available on our platform, but you can look for independent assessments uh, of different investment strategies. So on the, uh, on the U Invest website, you can find square mile reports, which are independently written reviews of fund managers. You can also find research from Morningstar, which again are independent reviews from, uh, from different analysts looking at different fund information. The financial press is a great source of information. You can never ever stop learning uh, in, inve in, invest in the investment world uh, and, uh, and in reading all of the, the key financial uh, press is a great way of constantly keeping up to date with that information. Now I would certainly say don't be afraid to ask questions. Email fund managers, um, ask them questions you want to. They, they want to hear from their investors uh, and they want to, uh, to help uh, inform and educate investors as to what they're thinking and what they're doing. So certainly do contact them uh, and they'll be very happy to help you on that. Read all the crucial documents. Read the KID document. Look at the fact sheet. It'll give you a brilliant 
summary of where the managers invested, how they think, what their sector allocation is, what the charges are, what the performance is. So there's lots of information that can be gleaned from looking at a fact sheet. But also, if you're not sure about all of these different things, we have a great tool with the AJ Bell Favourite Funds uh, area of our website under Investment Ideas that can help you filter down the fund universe, uh, where we do a lot of the work for you to give you a much more condensed version uh, to help you uh, choose the investments that you think are most appropriate for you. So just quickly, a few uh, different lessons uh, when thinking about uh, looking at fund managers. Good fund managers exist, but they are hard to find. Outperforming on a consistent basis is very, very difficult. Um, you should only invest in, in, in active managers when you believe that they can outperform. Ma outperforming is so difficult. This is why the, the names of fund managers that are hugely successful are so well known. It's why you know the name Neil Woodford, Ian Spreadbury at Fidelity, Andrew Rose at, to uh, at, at uh, Schroeder's, Harry Nimmo at Standard Life. Yeah, these managers have become very well known because they are very good at what they do and because outperforming the market is so difficult. They, they stand out amongst their peers. Past performance, as we said, do not rely on past performance. It can be a very dangerous red herring uh, when, when reviewing your investments. It's also really important to look at what's doing badly as well as what's doing well. Um, we, I, I think of it about, I look at the good, I look at the bad, and I also look at the ugly. Uh, and some of these investment funds that potentially look very, very ugly, you know, they're doing very badly, are the source of some of my best ideas in terms of where I want to invest. It, things that are horribly out of favor. You know, that may well be right now looking at oil, for example. Oil is a, an area where, where, uh, where, man, where, where the, the oil price is being squeezed down. It's horribly out of favor. But, but, but potentially that may be an interesting I example. For all of these things, it's important that you understand how a manager invests before you give them your money. It's, it's a very painful way of learning about a manager after you've given them your money. You may well have some successes, but finding out a manager doesn't have a great process, doesn't have a great philosophy after you've trusted them with your money is a very painful lesson. Uh, and as long as you learn from that lesson, uh, then that, that's important. But it's better to do your research up front and do the hard work early on. If you're not comfortable looking at, at these types of, uh, of areas and thinking about the way you invest, uh, then the AJ Bell Passive Funds have been designed for absolutely this purpose. Uh, and you can find more information about the funds where, where we, we do the hard work for you. You can find more information about that on our website. So just a couple of things to remember uh, in, in summary. I think it's really important that you understand your own behavioral tendencies. Uh, fear and greed will result in you making irrational decisions. It's very important that, that, you, that you understand uh, and don't jump in on the latest fad uh, and that you behave rationally uh, when, when assessing your investment portfolio. You should also accept that you will make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. The best managers in the market are likely to only get about 60% of their investments decisions right. Now, they will make 40% of their decisions they make will be wrong. Uh, and that I think is actually a very sobering thought. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but patience is, uh, is, is often rewarded. Is, I think it's critical in the investment world to be patient and it's, uh, it's often overlooked. You should do your research. We've, we've highlighted a few areas where you should look at uh, and uh, you should research constantly and do the work up front. Understand all of this before you invest. Uh, and the last point there, be an investor, not a collector. A fund manager said that to me when I was starting out in my investment career and it's absolutely right. <coughs> Excuse me. Think about your overall investment strategy. Understand the holdings that you have. Understand the holdings that you have and how they work together. Think about it holistically. It's very easy to end up with a collection of holdings because you've invested in a variety of different areas over time rather than having an overall investment strategy. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, a, uh, a, a dangerous way of, of ending up with a portfolio that's not diversified uh, and really doesn't. Uh, doesn't uh, hang together and give you the protection that you'll need in the bad times, but also help you with the, having exposure to the things uh, that are doing well in the good times. 
So in summary, we've covered quite a lot of ground there, and apologies for, for racing through so much uh, content, but it is a, a fascinating area that, uh, that, that, that I think you know, we could spend a far more uh, amount of time on. I think investment is nicely summed up by this quote from George Soros, who obviously a very famous investor. If investing is entertaining, if you're having fun, you're probably not making any money. Good investing is boring. Uh, and I would sum that up by saying there is no substitute for hard work uh, and you will be rewarded if you do that hard work up front before you invest uh, and, and, and don't find out the painful lessons uh, too late when you've already entrusted a manager who does badly for you with your money. So with that, uh, I've covered all the ground uh, that I wanted to, uh, and I'm very happy to take uh, questions. We've had uh, we've had some some questions uh, come in uh, already, which is great. So we'll try and get through a few of these, conscious uh, of your time. So bear with me a second while I uh, while I, I scan uh, a couple of these. Um, that's a very good question. I, I, I touched on some of the points. How do you assess fund managers as people if you don't meet them as individual investors? I think that that is a really important point because this is combining what we've talked about with the uh, with the art and the science. And we're very lucky, in, and I'm very lucky in my position, that I get to meet all different managers across across the entire market. Uh, there, um, I think what's important is to is to is to read a lot uh, about about the managers. These managers will produce uh, lots and lots of written content uh, that, um, that, that explains to you how they invest, will uh, explain to you how they think, will explain their current positioning. Uh, and you'll also be able to read this independent research that we carry on on our website to help you paint a picture uh, of that manager. Yeah, but also, these managers often are very happy uh, to talk to different, uh, different investors directly, so don't be afraid to contact them. Um, in, in terms of and ask them questions about what they are doing. You might not be able to get to speak necessarily directly to them, but they will certainly answer your questions and uh, and get back to you. So just uh, another another question: uh, Are AJ Bell own funds active or passive? Our funds are are passive solutions. Uh, we invest in in index tracking funds to implement our investment uh, strategy uh, there which has kept our costs uh, very very low and uh, very happy uh, so have a look at our website there's a lot more information about our our own funds uh, on uh, on the uh, website so in, there's a question here uh, is uh, is there uh, is there a size of fund that is just too big or vice versa too small from taking the too small point first, what's important to look at is the level of cost on those small funds. So sm there are small funds out there, and, uh, and, and, and it may well be that their fixed costs just make the early, uh, the, the, the TR, the total expense ratio, or the OCF, the ongoing charges figure, it may well make that look uh, incredibly high in the early days. So I think it's important to, to look at the costs and the fund size uh, on the uh, on the smaller funds on a larger on the larger funds from a from a personal perspective uh, I think when you see equity funds that get significantly into the billions uh, then that that makes me nervous but as I mentioned earlier large cap investment funds can certainly be uh, quite a few billion in size and not be to detriment of uh, investment performance smaller companies funds you would certainly want to see those a lot smaller uh, and managers will often close their funds uh, to new investors when they get to a certain size so again that's another question that's worth asking fund managers is what is their capacity how much money can they run in a particular strategy and the reason it's worth asking about capacity is because it's not just um, it's not just about the fund size that you may see because you may see a fund size of say one billion pounds but they may be running a lot of other money in a very similar strategy so it's the overall strategy assets uh, that are in import important um, let's take uh, another one um, how to get the best investments for beginners uh, how do we get the best investments for beginners I think it's important that you understand your um, your risk profile have do some some self analysis really about uh, what your risk profile is how much you're prepared to lose the areas you're you're comfortable investing what your time horizon is uh, and look for funds that give you uh, an instant portfolio so look for diversified funds uh, as a way of uh, uh, 
of giving you an instant portfolio as a beginner so that you're not necessarily putting all of your eggs um, in in one basket so there's a question here about investment trusts are investment trusts funds as well well they are but they're structured differently uh, to uh, to OICs uh, and unit trusts um, now we've got some information on our website about investment trusts uh, and uh, uh, and I, I would urge you to have a look at that there's a, there's a very different structure and there's some some nuances around that structure that uh, that I won't go into here because that's a it's a whole new presentation uh, in its in its own right uh, there there's a question about uh, are fund charges going to reduce over time uh, and that I think is a very good question now actually uh, on this point uh, the FCA tomorrow uh, is releasing details of, uh, of a study it's doing into the asset management industry with a whole uh, host of different um, different uh, conclusions around the investment industry uh, and fund charges which may well set out a very different approach to uh, to in to investment charges and this covers another question I've just seen come in about does the TER genuinely cover all costs uh, and this is will be something that will be covered in the FCA uh, report that's coming out tomorrow so uh, so do have a look in the uh, financial papers uh, and online tomorrow uh, and over the next couple of days and at the weekend because there will be a huge amount written uh, about investment costs uh, I would think uh, and TERs and the ongoing charges figure um, in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, how, where what the direction of travel uh, is how do you obtain answers to some of the points you've raised for example process well here this is where you need to contact the fund manager really ask the fund manager for detailed information about their investment process most managers will be very very happy to share this with you and if they're not then you should ask them some questions about why not why will not why aren't they happy to to share this information about process so they will uh, they will um, they will absolutely have information about how they think how they behave what uh, what the market is looking like uh, for, for them how they implement that strategy uh, and that I think is, a, is an excellent way uh, of doing that but do not be shy to ask the uh, uh, ask the, uh, the the manager how they think what weight should be put on past performance uh, funds say we should invest for long term how good it, how good is it well I think we, a couple of examples we use there about the danger of simply looking at past performance. Now, it's, it's not a case of, of, of saying that past performance is bad. Past performance is absolutely uh, an informative way of, of helping you assess someone's investment approach. But the key for me is simply not to look at just past performance. Yeah, every manager can be lucky, as we talked about, uh, and it's harder to separate those 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 that are skillful from the lucky. Now, the way I use past performance is as a way of verifying whether they are investing in a way that I think they understand, uh, that I understand. So actually, I used an example earlier on about M&G recovery as a manager that had performed very poorly. Now, actually, that manager's investment style was out of favor with the market. So I actually expected him to underperform in that period. So I'm not as concerned about a manager underperforming uh, when I expect him that he should underperform. Uh, I, would eke, I would be as much worried about a manager underperforming when they shouldn't as outperforming when they shouldn't because that means I've either misunderstood how they invest or, uh, or they're investing in a way that is different to the way that they've explained that to me. Uh, so past performance is important. I would simply say do not only make your decisions based on past performance. Uh, use the other information I've talked about here today uh, as a way of guiding you through that and, and making an assessment as to whether that past performance was simply lucky uh, or there is evidence of skill. So there's a question, a very good question actually, about when when should you leave a fund? When should you sell? Uh, and that's a great question because it's 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 a much easier investment decision to decide to invest uh, than it is to decide to sell. Now we use I used an example earlier on uh, about um, uh, about a manager that left. Uh, so there for me that was a clear that was a clear sell. Uh, where that the, the performance of that fund was beholden to that investment manager uh, and and that for me was a was a reason for me to want to get out of that fund 
but also I think we're looking it's not just about as we as we talked earlier about looking at poor performance because you need to understand why a manager has performed like that uh, it's about looking looking and thinking about is a manager deviating from the way that you understand the way they will invest uh, and, and, and that it that is crucial so if you see evidence of deviation from your understanding then you need to reappraise that manager now it may not be that's always a sell it may well be that you need to do more work to understand that manager uh, or you may well you know, want to put that manager on a notional watch uh, and and pay closer attention to it over the next few months but equally you do need to uh, to be patient um, in in what you do and on a related question someone's asked about the how long should you give a fund manager to give them a chance well investment is a long-term uh, a long-term business you need to be patient and this is about being an investor not a collector uh, as I managed uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, and and this is about taking a three-year view taking a five-year view uh, on invest on when you invest now B you do need to be pragmatic because the world changes events change so you do need to reappraise your portfolio uh, and keep it under review and make sure that these investments are still appropriate for you but you need to think you need to think about uh, how um, yeah, that, that think think long term be patient because every time you change an investment transaction costs eat into your returns and it's really important that you do think for the long term sorry there's many questions coming in which is brilliant so I'm just uh, I'm just uh, skim skim reading um, I'm skim reading a few different ones here. So on, on fund charges, please elaborate on fund charges. Are they reflected in the daily offer price? So so yes, the 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 TR or the OCF that you will see quoted uh, absolutely um, covers uh, is incorporated into the daily price that you see. So those uh, the, uh, the 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 administration side that is calculating the fund price apportions one three hundred and sixty fifth of the cost to the fund price every single day. So that is reflecting the fund price. What uh, in the fund charges? What it's not looking at, uh, not is not factoring in is transaction costs. So those are on top of the ongoing charges figure. And as I mentioned, that's something that I think will be tackled by the uh, by the FCA in tomorrow's paper. So it may well be a case of uh, of we have quite a bit of change facing in industry over the next uh, the next few months. What's the key information you should look for on a fact sheet that's not on the kid? Well, on the kid, it's quite prescribed as to what it's very prescribed as to what is there. It's laid down by the regulator. So objective, policy, risk and charges uh, and performance. Uh, on the fact sheet, what that's designed to do is to give you far more uh, information about what the current positioning of the fund is. So you should look at uh, on that on that fact sheet if it carries this information, and most of them do, top 10 holdings. Uh, will be there uh, I, would, I would imagine uh, and so you should you, know, you will be able to judge from that how concentrated the portfolio is do they have a few holdings that are very big positions in the fund or do they have uh, a much more diversified fund you'll be able to look at the geographic, geographical positioning if the fund is a global fund uh, in terms of, uh, of where they're invested are they excessively weighted towards one region maybe that's China maybe that's the US maybe that's Japan You'll be able to look at the sector exposure. So if it's maybe just a UK equity fund, you'll be able to see um, if they are exposed to the oil sector, the mining sector, the, uh, the consumer goods sector. And again, you'll be able to see that level of exposure to see whether you are comfortable. Uh, so there's a huge amount of information on the, uh, uh, on the uh, fact sheet. It'll often it'll carry charges, it'll carry uh, pricing information. So, uh, so uh, I, would, I would urge you to have a, have a look at different fact sheets, have a look at them over time, get comfortable with the information that you see uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and really uh, use it to paint a picture of what the fund manager is thinking. What's the maximum number of funds you should have? Well, this is this is very much a personal question, a personal preference. I think, uh, in terms of your own investment strategy, uh, I think it's important that you uh, that you have an investment strategy, then you have a plan, uh, and you build a portfolio that's that's that works for your plan. 
you know, if you have lots and lots of diversified funds, it may well be that having a whole host of different holdings, maybe you're over diversified, but equally it's important that you don't have all your eggs uh, in one basket. It's, you know, that's the old adage would go. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's down to personal preference and down to your own uh, investment strategy uh, there. There's a very good question here about how important is a manager's personal investment in the fund and where can we find this information? Well, that information uh, is something that we ask for managers uh, when we invest because we want to see that they are backing their own investment approach uh, with their own money. Uh, and you'll be unsurprised to hear that invariably most managers do invest um, significantly into their own funds. Finding this information is very difficult. The only way I've ever been able to find it is to ask the manager outright. But again, don't be afraid to email the fund manager, the fund group, and ask for this information. They are more than happy to share this type of information uh, if they think that it helps you paint a picture as to how the ma what the manager is uh, is thinking. We've got a question about performance fees. How important is a performance fee? So this is a uh, this is a fee that is uh, sometimes charged on top of the uh, the annual management charge and the ongoing charges. And here they will often uh, take a percentage of the growth over time over an, on an annual basis if they're delivering very very good returns. So you might find that a manager will take 20% of all returns over the performance of the FTSE all share, for example. Now here. Um, this is not necessarily the most common um, uh, of investment charging structures. There are some out there that do this. Now, I generally take the view that performance fees are not necessarily, <coughs> excuse me, that welcome uh, and uh, and need to be need to be uh, structured very very appropriately and fairly. Uh, so that not only uh, are they do they uh, take a performance view when things are going good, but actually they they have uh, they have to make when they're performing uh, poorly that they have to catch up before they earn that performance fee uh, again. So it's a, it's a complex area um, uh, there, but there are there are not many funds that will that will use um, uh, performance fees. So. The question here about is the is where a fund is branded growth or value is this not a reason to avoid it? Surely the best managers are flexible um, and change when conditions change. Well, I, I would I would disagree with that uh, to a point um, because managers and we've talked here talked quite a lot earlier on about in managers investment style uh, and the way that they can exploit that style. Now, actually, very very few managers. Are, have a flexible approach that are able to find good uh, ideas in both growth and value markets. It's actually it's highly unusual to find these very very pragmatic uh, managers that, that that can do that. And and even the best, you know, if we went right back to Anthony Bolton, at Fidelity Special Situations back in the in the 90s and and through uh, the early part of the last decade, and that's a manager uh, that is quite clearly a value manager. Uh, and had a fantastic track record, but equally was very uh, much out of favour when value was out of favour. You know, we saw Neil Woodford do very poorly uh, back in 1990-2000 when his value approach was out of favour. Um, so I, I would certainly contend that those two managers are have been great fund managers over time uh, and haven't been necessarily that pragmatic in their approach. Now, they've been actually very dogmatic uh, when the market has disagreed with their approach and have been uh, have been able to uh, uh, be patient uh, and and stick to their investment approach. Uh, and that's why I urge uh, all of you when you're looking at different strategies and investing to be patient because the market changes uh, and it's, it's very difficult to find a manager that can outperform in all different types of environments. Um, what, what have we got uh, next? Um, let's have a look. Uh, on the investment uh, trust um, side of things, thinking about investment trust rather than just funds, uh, how significant are directors in influencing performance? The direct, an investment trust is structured as a company. 
uh, and therefore they have a duty to managing the company. The directors have a duty to manage um, the, uh, the, the, the the company. But the investment manager is very different to uh, the investment director. So the directors have the responsibility for appointing the investment manager. So you could argue they're very significant in that performance. Uh, but but the the director should equally be uh, at arm's length from the investment manager when they are uh, making their investment decisions. So they're important in setting the uh, the overall direction in terms of appointing the investment manager, uh, but they are not making day-to-day -day, uh, investment um, decisions. So we'll just take uh, conscious of time. I'll take. I'll, I'll quickly run through uh, one more because we've got we've got lots and lots of uh, uh, of questions. Um, let's uh, look. At, uh, over what time frame is alpha and beta ratios calculated? We touched on the on the mathematics side of things on a slide uh, earlier. Well, you can actually, uh, using different systems, calculate them over uh, any time period you like. But I think what's important is to give uh, a decent amount of time to calculate this. So typically, we look at at least uh, a one-year basis, uh, if not a three-year basis, to give uh, give relevance to uh, to the time and the calculation that you use uh, there. So uh, uh, you, you, that, that you will see them over a whole host of different time periods, but typically you'll see them over a one-year period or a three-year period, and I think that should give you confidence that is a, an accurate reflection of what is going on uh, in the fund. So with that, um, I'm conscious we've we've hit the uh, the magic hour that we said we would uh, we would stick to. I'm really sorry if we didn't get through all of your questions. There's fantastic questions coming in, so thank you for that. If you have got uh, questions that you'd like uh, you'd like me to answer, you'd like us to answer, then please do feel free to email uh, them through to us, uh, and I'll endeavour to get back to you uh, on those. Uh, there's uh, there's lots and lots there, so uh, I'll, I will do what I can. Uh, I just uh, takes me uh, just to thank you very much uh, for listening to this uh, this webinar, uh, and do look out for the uh, the email coming through with the feedback and the the ability to download the slides. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again soon uh, on the future webinars that we do. Thank you very much.